And I know that you have a lot of experience both curating arts exhibits and as well as curating art science exhibits. Like how, what are like your experiences with both and um, differences when you're thinking about one or the other? So when I think of curation in general, um, it is building a story and a narrative for people who come in. And I think um, pairing things together is mainly the curator's job. You're making sense of things that are already interesting and beautiful. It's just about bringing them together. And sometimes that heightens how they talk to each other. I do think that artworks in a room, they, they talk to each other. And that's what can be so immersive and so brilliant. Um, just before I talk about my own work, you know, I was recently in Vienna last year for a conference. And I remember going to the museum and you walk in and there's these beautiful, you know, like Gustav Klimt paintings. And they have right next to them headphones to put on to listen to the great masters of the era, you know, during Vienna's like high renaissance of, 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 uh, of composers. And of course, you know, it doesn't dawn on you till you're there, but now I can't unsee it that you, of course you would have these paintings in grand estately homes with the music playing. It's the culture, the atmosphere. And though in not the, that exact way, that inspires a lot of my work and having that, you know, beyond the bare white cube, it's, it's a space. And that space is to be felt, touched, you know, lived in almost. Um, not the artworks themselves, but it should be that kind of experience. At least I hope that I can, cre that I create things like that. And the first time I explored it was with the Art Matters Festival in, um, that I already mentioned, uh, the Disconnect exhibition. Um, it was held at Espace Pup, which is in Montreal. And it was just a fairly tiny room. We didn't really know um, what we were going to do with it, but we had a launch party because we were working with Nuit Blanche at the time, which is um, an annual arts festival in Montreal. Um, and uh, we had these artists, and I remember strategically walking around the space, and we ended up doing, um, we ended up organizing it so that when you walk in, um, we had on a plinth this kind of arm, um, it was a glove that was on a on a stand, and it was kind of perplexing because it was actually used in a performance that happened every half hour or so by the artist who stayed um, in the space, uh, because he used the hand um, to play music. He had he had computed it, and it was linked to his computer, so he was conducting and playing the music because as he was conducting, he was controlling different notes. Um, it didn't sound maybe as melodious as, you know, us going to a concert, but the technology behind the artistic vision of what if I can compose and play at the same time is brilliant. But so you walk in and see this hand, and my idea with that was literally to pull you in and turn you to the left, because we had this brilliant opposition of, like, on the right side, we had these drawings um, by an artist in Montreal who... Um, just did these heart-wrenchingly beautiful sketches of mental illness. So they, she had one on depression, on anxiety, on anorexia. And it it was um, a personal expression. It was very, very personal and um, intense. And they were quite small. So you had to go up to them to physically look closer at them. So they were, I gave them a lot of space because I wanted you to have to engage with it at a, at closely. Um, because mental illness is difficult and it is uncomfortable and the space was to reflect that and opposite it we had this corner that kind of was a complete contrast instead of the stark wall we had um, beanbag chairs and these old retro tvs um, with string lights up and um, we had this great uh, artist who goes by the name of gar but her name is diana lazaro and she um she took EEG scans of her um, brain when she was inducing different emotions in herself. So like happiness, fear, sadness. Um, and then when you take an EEG scan, it, it gives you like different um, uh, pinpoints. You know, it's like a diagram. So it'll show um, highs and lows. And um, the science behind it is not something I've looked at extensively. But when we looked at her work, what was so fascinating was she took that those results and then she 
kind of in the same way that our first artist made music added from his hand, she made music from these scanned results um, and then overlaid an RGB color scheme on a TV screen that would complement it. And though when you listen to it, it's quite jarring and so are the images, sitting in that comfortable space and hearing and seeing something that was recorded from inside your brain, kind of translated through these different technologies while looking at this very personal expression of some of those intense feelings, um, was ways that they could talk to each other. These works could talk to each other without us having to say it. You know, you're sitting, listening, and the TVs were kind of positioned outward so that they could they can talk. Um, and then all the while, we had this big screen uh, down at the back of the gallery space, um, and it was a project by um, these two artists, Timothy Thomason and Owen Coolidge, and they um, took Twitter analytics to find um, it's the it was a map of Montreal with different colors. And the analytics were trying to find, they had a, I think it was over 8,000 word catalog of finding words that were happy, sad, frustrated, or angry. And you could see where in Montreal, in real time, people were happy or sad, and you could see those concentrations coming through. So it was an, um, almost like a statistical inquiry, but also with people's emotions. Um, it was just a fascinating combination of works. They did not plan this together, and yet the curator's job is to say, you're looking at it through this perspective and touching on the science of um, maybe health, the health, um, the health side of mental illness, and you're looking at how our brain works and different methods we can understand it, and you are looking at data analytics and how can we turn that into almost like an artistic geography um, a moving geography and saying, well, actually you're all talking about more or less the same thing. And we can explore that in one way by standing in the center of a very tiny room. So that, I mean, that was one of my favorite projects. <laughs> great. And this is a great note to end on. Um, this is such a fascinating topic and the things that you've mentioned, I feel like we could have a really long discussion that goes yeah. <laughs> hours about it. Um, but it would be really great that we'll put the uh, links to some of the things that you've mentioned down below. And thanks so much for joining us today to share your experiences and to unravel this really fascinating topic. Thanks so much, Kim. No problem. Thank you, Emily. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Beyond Codes and Aesthetics. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. Beyond Codes and Aesthetics is produced by Kohei and Translations on Himalaya Podcasts by Will Jung. Take care and see you next time.